So with this, uh, I would like to welcome you more formally to this session of Global Talks. Um, I hope you're all doing well uh, now at the tail end of the January session, going through the somewhat mild form of lockdown, but still surviving these strange COVID times. So um, let me, before we start off, uh, acknowledge uh, with respect, you know, the Lekwungen uh, peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Sasquam, and the Sonish peoples, whose historical relationships with this land continue to this day. And today we will hear from Julian a little bit in greater detail how different indigenous communities have played an increasingly important role in taking on stewardship and in guiding our approaches to adapting to a new world in terms of climate change and what we can do. So I'm really pleased that Julian will um, include this very strongly, the, the sense of territory and territorial stewardship that relates to the First Nations here in on the West Coast, but also more broadly across the world. Now, that brings me to, um, to the very pleasurable task to introduce to our uh, pre presenter today, Julian Yates, you know, who is um, a CFJS visiting scholar and his home institution at the moment is that he works as an Australian Research Council Early Career Research Fellow and lecturer in human geography at Monash University, um, uh, which is located on the territory, traditional territory of the Kulin Nations in Melbourne, Australia. He also, Julian, holds um, a PhD from the University of British Columbia and an MA uh, from U of H. We just discussed this, uh, introducing this. He worked with Jutta, uh, who is on the call here, and he holds a BA uh, degree from the University of Manchester. So his educational background is tu truly global. Uh, and also, I should add that he has decade of experience working in the Andes, um, working with communities on site. So um, a truly global academic existence, working with communities around uh, the world. Um, so as we will see in a second, Julian's um, field of research is to, um, is to engage in and shed light on forms of intercultural learning and uh, looking at indigenous environmental stewardship campaigns, trying to understand how our response and adaptation to climate change can be promoted in particular ways that take stock of, uh, of attachment to the land, of knowledge of the land, and of innovative policy opportunities in this respect. And I'm really um, thrilled to have Julian present to us today on, um, and I cite here his presentation's title, Guides of Water, Indigenous Hydro-Social Territories Beyond Adaptation to Climate Change, indicating what we need to do, but I'll leave this to Julian to explain, um, is to really think about a proper stewardship of the land and profound changes to how we deal with our natural environment. With this, Julian, it's such a pleasure having you as a visiting Hello, I'm at the center and uh, it's our great pleasure to give you the floor now and hear a bit more in detail about your ongoing research. The floor is all yours, Johnny. Thanks so much, Oliver. That was a very generous introduction. You covered a, a lot of ground and um, I've never heard anyone introduce me in such a global sense before, but um, <laughs> now that you mentioned it, I, I guess it kind of makes sense. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Oliver, for the introduction and for the invitation to talk today. So I'm coming to you today from Vancouver, actually, so on the unceded territories of the Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And as an employee of Monash University, as you pointed out, it's located on the lands of the Kulin Nations. So I'd like to acknowledge the elders, past, present, and future of the Kulin Nations. At Monash, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a lecturer in human geography, as well as a DECRA fellow, a Discovery Early, Early Career Research Fellow, and I wanted to come back to some of the work that I'm developing for that project, but today I will mostly be focusing on some of my work in, in Peru that I've been developing over the last 10 or 11 years. And in presenting some of my work in Peru, I'd like to acknowledge the many families and communities that have, and Quechua communities that welcome me onto their lands and, and into their homes. So in focusing today on guides of water, means um, taking a detailed look at the role of, of camoyoc, like the camoyoc in this photo 
I'll explain the, the particular term kamaiok in a little bit more detail later, but for today's purposes, they can be considered as specialists and leaders in certain areas of, of production and environmental governance and indeed stewardship, as Oliver pointed out. So today I'm going to discuss their role as guides of water, a role that has historic underpinnings but has been incorporated into contemporary development and adaptation programming. So I'm going to connect the role of these individuals and others like them to the potential to move beyond technocratic adaptation programs to instead focus on these aspects of intercultural processes for supporting hydropastoral territories in the Andes that span cultural groups, geographies and diverse forms of, of knowledge sharing. <clears throat> so that'll be the main focus of my talk today on this case of the Guides of Water. I do just want to try and bookend it a little bit by locating it in my broader research program and then coming back to some of my current work that does actually relate thematically as well as empirically to some of the work that I've been doing in Peru. So to begin, before I get into the case, a little bit more about me given that um, socializing as a visiting scholar has been a bit more problematic than would otherwise be the case. Um, I identify as a community engaged political ecologist and development geographer and my research lies at the intersection of some of these, these key words down here that I'll, I'll let you read but I just wanted to point out that my research career began at UVEC I would say um, under the influence of Yuta Gutbullet who's with us today and I did some work in Brazil working with recyclers cooperatives and I followed that by working with an NGO in Nepal on some climate change adaptation programs. And the influence of both of these um, research paths, I suppose, come, what should come through in today's presentation. I'm happy to sort of talk about the links later on. But following those two projects, I launched my work in Peru, uh, working with Kamayok and their knowledge sharing practices and looking most specifically at their work in upholding pastoral livelihoods in the Andes. And that was the foundation of my PhD, <clears throat> but it, it does continue today and is evolving and there are lots of offshoot uh, research projects. And one issue that's emerged since the PhD is this, this topic of hydropastoral management that I'm gonna to talk to you about today, located in, in conversations both with interculturality, but also with um, adaptation to climate change. So in focusing on the Peruvian Andes today, I just wanted to clarify where roughly I'm going to be talking about mostly. Most of my work's been focused in the regions of Canas and Canchis in the department of Cusco and in the regions of Aymaras and Antabamba in the department of Apurimac. It's a very complex part of the world and I'm happy to talk more about it in question period, but this is really just a signal. This is where most of my work has taken place and this is roughly where I'm going to be talking about when I mentioned the Peru's southern Andes in, in the presentation today. So the case I'm, I want to present is this Guides of Water. And it's going to appear in a book later this year, hopefully, um, an, in, an edited collection on indigenous water and drought management in a changing world. And the theme emerged from empirical significance, by which I mean, I didn't really intend to study adaptation, climate change adaptation programs in the Andes. But as I traveled around for, for other research purposes, I kept bumping into these programs and the effects they were having. And then most recently in 2018, most of the Kamayok I was speaking with had something unprompted to say about these programs, these adaptation programs, particularly those that focused on water, irrigation and pastoral management. And this is partly, I think, because of the context of environmental change that we see in this part of the world, more erratic rainfall, hail and frosts, but also declining precipitation overall and declining snowpacks and reduced overland flows of water and, and less water being preserved in pastures to keep um, livestock healthy. And these little holes in this photo that you see, uh, little cotches, these are mini depressions in the land that are made to restore water so that alpacas can drink from the holes. And, it, and it's these kinds of ongoing everyday hydrosocial and hydropastoral engagements that I'll focus on today. When I'm talking about adaptation programs, I'm not talking about grand programs like the intertransfer of water between basins, for example. I'm talking about these everyday kind of practices in Andean communities high in the Andes. <clears throat> I just mentioned the hydrosocial and the hydropastoral aspects. So before I really get into the details of the case, I just want to uh, clarify some of the terminology and some of the theoretical backdrop to this. So I'm not going to get into too much theoretical detail, but just to clarify some terms. I've been working recently with literature on 
hypersociality, which builds on long running political ecology work to understand the co evolution and the co constitutional aspects of water in terms of the social and the material dynamics. And in this chapter that I've, that I've been writing, I've been playing around with linking that body of literature to literature from the Andes on hydraulic agropastoralism. So I'm using the term hydropastoral to refer to the co-determining aspects of water and pastoral management, attempting to attend to the social, cultural and the material together. And, and I hope that that will come through today. And hydrosocial territories is a term that's linked to the hydrosocial concept. And when I refer to hydro territorial restructuring, it's about the ways in which hydrosocial relations across space can be understood to transform um, water environments. And I'm going to be using it in this presentation to link to some of the traditional Andean ways of understanding collectivism and organization across space, particularly in managing the commons. Finally, then the Andean living world or the Andean living community relates to the more than human relations involved in the animation of Pachamama or Mother Earth. And, and I'll unpack this a bit more as I go, but essentially this relates to the animist ontology in the Andes, understanding the more than human uh, flows and circulations that uphold the world that, in, within which um, Quechua communities exist. And behind the scenes of all this, then I think there's influence from the hydrosocial literature, from political ecologies of water and agrarian change, as well as critical approaches to adaptation to climate change. And I'm happy to talk more about that later, but I do ultimately hope to contribute to some of these debates through this chapter. But for today's uh, presentation's purposes, I really wanted to focus on the, the empirical story here around um, how Kamayak have become important actors in contemporary climate change adaptation and some of the implications, challenges and opportunities are presented by that. So doing so, means focusing on, on camera for a little bit for the first part of this presentation. So what I want to do is introduce some of their historic hydropastoral management practices and then link that into how they've become important in contemporary development and adaptation programming. And I'll follow that then by having a more, more engaged discussion about the challenges and opportunities. So Felipe Guaman Poma's book, uh, The First New Chronicle and Good Government, is a famous account of pre-Hispanic governance systems and mechanisms in many sectors in the Andean um, space prior to the arrival of the Spanish. Um, it's particularly focused on, on the Inca, um, but also relates to pre-Inca societies as well. The original cover of the book is on the right. And if you were to flip through the pages of this chronicle, you would see a series of other diagrams and drawings as well. Many of those depict the work of the Kamayok. The most famous of those was the Kipu Kamayok. Um, it was a kind of an accountant for the Inca who used this system of knotted cords to keep track of Andean production and the circulation of goods. I mention that just because quite a few people have heard of the Kipu Kamayok if they've, if they've studied um, pre-Hispanic history in the Andes. But there, there were also depictions of many Kamayok related to agriculture and pastoralism as well. Kamayok were responsible for overseeing production in the fields, which were known as chakras. These are irrigated uh, cultivation fields. They also predicted um, sowing and harvesting times by reading celestial patterns. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But they were known as Yanka Kamayok. Uh, and linking to sowing and harvesting times, they were also responsible for overseeing um, irrigation infrastructures and technologies. And they also linked directly to pastoralism and to some of these um, uh, animist ontologies of pastoralism and the ways in which they led ceremonies, for example, by sacrificing alpacas in order to appease uh, sacred deities like quackers depicted in the top left of this diagram, as well as the apples, sacred mountains, and so on. And I'll come back to some of these um, relationships specifically as I go, but what I wanted to do here is just to show that the, the work of the Kamayak has often been to integrate these understandings of water management and of pastoral management together. It's been a, a focus of Kamayak work for centuries. Indeed, it predates the Inca state, the Inca empire as well. Um, prior to the Inca, Kamayak participated in what Kevin Lane has described as, and I quote, it's a bit of a mouthful, water bureaucracies in pre-Inca community-managed non-state societies of agro-pastoralism. 
what that means is water was an organizing principle for these pre-Inca non-state societies, meaning that there were um, individuals responsible for managing water and that these were organized in a sort of semi-bureaucratic way. So let me just elaborate the role of the Camayoc in upholding this. Prior to being embedded in the Inca state, then the Camayoc functioned on a rotational basis, either by being elected or appointed as managers of various hydraulic agropastoral infrastructure. There were two different types of infrastructure. Um, this is building on Kevin Lane's work. There was dry infrastructure for agricultural production, like canals and reservoirs for so on and so on, kind of infrastructure we're fairly familiar with. There was also wet infrastructure for pastoralism. This included those, those cotches, the sunken ponds, um, as well as bofedales, which are irrigated moors, and fodder chakras. So these are fields that are maintained for alpacas to feed on, but they also act as a store of water and of slowly infiltrating water, particularly uphill, so that it recharges aquifers and rivers and groundwater downhill. Importantly, these dry and wet infrastructure were used simultaneously and dynamically and uh, amongst communities. And this dynamism required a system for managing water distribution amongst different uses. So according to Kevin Lane, a communitized system of water control emerged and that revolved or relied upon the role of, of Kamayok. This system stretched across hydrogeographical space and distinct groups. And this is a point I'll come back to later when looking at some of the opportunities for working with Kamayok in context of environmental change. And it revolved around the work of Kocha Kamayok for maintaining the Kochas, Unu Kamayok for maintaining other irrigation infrastructure, and the Yanka Kamayok, those that read the celestial patterns, predicted harvesting times, and also led ceremonies relating to um, alpacas. So it's a very brief um, introduction to some of the histories of um, Kamayok, but the, the point that I wanted to make here was twofold. One, that Kamayok have been central to upholding these inter-community water management practices for centuries. But also some of these practices have been pointed to in, in academic literature more recently, um, highlighting their potential to build adaptive capacity to environmental change today. So Ochoa Tokachi, for example, and some colleagues demonstrated that the system of infiltrating water uphill and allowing it to um, recharge aquifers and rivers and lakes and so on downhill, which they describe as a 1400 year old practice, can be um, useful today if it's upscaled and complement to complement modern adaptation strategies. Similarly, Ben Orlov and some colleagues um, previously demonstrated that the centuries-old method of reading celestial patterns to forecast seasonal rainfall, like the Yanka Kamayoka did, uh, did as I mentioned, is linked to El Nino variability. This indicates that actually Andean um, pastoralists and agriculturalists have long understood seasonal variations of rainfall in the Andes. It also suggests that Andean farmers have been and continue to be more adaptive to shifting rainfall patterns and climatic variables than those perhaps always acknowledged. But it's also significantly, I think, given justification to the ways in which actors like Kamayok have been um, incorporated into adaptation and development programs and the ways in which they've been retrained as specialists in water management. So I want to move into that now before getting into some of the discussion about how Kamayok management of water, including through some of these traditional practices, um, has implications for how we understand environmental change. In the interest of time, this, this contemporary history has to be quite brief and it's really actually quite complicated and, and I can talk more about it later, later if, and if this is not entirely clear or if you have any questions. But the point for today is to show that Kamayok came became to be an important component of, of both NGO and state development and adaptation programming in Peru. There are two periods to highlight. The first is in the 1980s and the 1990s when two programs evolved involving Kamayok. One was um, instituted by the organization Soluciones Practicas, who in building their farmer to farmer training model or a campesino a campesino model, which essentially is a way of training farmers to train other farmers in, in the similar skill sets, they drew on the Kamayok moniker. So the farmer trainers um, were being called Kamayok. And so they developed a, a training program known as Escuela de Kamayok, 
it's not a physical school per se, but it's a, a broad training program that works across the Andes to train this network of, of Kemayok in the farmer to farmer methodology. At the same time, the Peruvian government and the Dutch Development Corporation launched a few projects, one of which was Plan Meris, an irrigation focused project. It evolved into um, what became known as Pachamama Raimi, which means the festival of Mother Earth. It had a similar methodology of, of this farmer training to train other farmers. And they were training what they called Unukamachik as guides of water. These Unukamachik were to um, go out into the Andes and to lead technical teams to adapt um, and adopt new technologies around water irrigation. So at this point, we see the embedding of, of Kamayak as an idea and as a practice within um, rural development um, programming in the Peruvian Andes. <clears throat> but the second phase to focus on, it starts in around 2009, when we see the Peruvian state become an increasing actor here in developing an adult professionalization program. Um, so what this really means is certifying the sort of technical skills and knowledges of rural actors um, in lieu of education that they may have missed out on. A lot of people in the Andes don't go, don't make it through primary school, let alone secondary school and on to other kind of technical education. Um, and they based this on the Escuela de Camayoc methodology. In fact, they enlisted Soluciones Practicas as a key partner. And at the same time, PAC Peru was launched. PAC Peru is the Adaptation to Climate Change program in Peru. Uh, it ran from 2009 to 2015 or 16. Um, and the idea here was to integrate that with this broader state reform program. So Kamayok that were being trained through a replication of this Escuela de Kamayok model were also to feed into the PAC Peru projects. And this would happen in part with Proyecto Pacocha, which was managed by Soluciones Practicas. Proyecto Pacocha just means Project Alpaca. And this included two things. One, it rolled out this state program. So they were training Camayoc to be certified as part of a state endorsed program that ultimately would become a nationwide program. And it was also designed to integrate with PAC Peru as the adaptation to climate change project. That is to say that Camayoc were trained through Proyecto Pacocha, both as beneficiaries of that training and as intermediaries to then go on and train other farmers in the sort of technologies, techniques and knowledges and expertise that aligned with the PAC Peru goals of adapting to climate change. So I'm gonna elaborate some of those links um, in a moment, but essentially um, what I did was follow some track Proyecto Pacocha over a number of years and, and then beyond. And between 2009 and 2013, Proyecto Pacocha trained 68 Camayoc in the kinds of areas that fed directly into PAC Peru's objectives like water resource management, irrigation technologies like reviving those cochas I mentioned, pasture management, rehabilitation of grasslands, and the ex expansion of bofedales, the irrigated moors that Camayoc have long been um, involved in upholding. And this maps onto some of PAC Peru's identified priorities. They, they identify what they call 10 low cost solutions for adapting to climate change. And seven of those explicitly linked with the work of the Camayoc and the training of Camayoc. I'm not gonna go into detail for all of these, but I did just wanna touch on a few of them to demonstrate some of the links between um, how we understand Camayoc histories and their role in adaptation programming, and, and also as an excuse to address some of the, the implications that come about through this kind of focus. The first one I want to highlight is this local climate monitoring, which in, invokes the historic practices of the Yanka Kamayak and reading celestial patterns, the kind of thing that the aspects that Ben Olov and his colleagues have pointed to as important for understanding climate change today. Um, Pak Peru casts these Yanka Kamayok as those who look to the sky. And this is partly about understanding Andean hydrocosmological cycles, which I'll unpack in a bit more detail a bit later. And it's not just about reading discrete weather events. Um, so there are questions here about the ways in which uh, reading hydrocosmological cycles in the Andes might be reconciled with adaptation logics of recording data for 
uh, understanding climate change um, and recording data over time. I'll sort of leave that tension alone for now, but just to signal the fact that what I'm getting to is this tension between Andean understandings of hydrocosmological cycles and sort of more modern development and adaptation understandings of environmental change in the Andes. The second part of these, this pack set of low cost solutions I wanted to highlight was water sowing and harvesting. And this comes back to the ideas of coches. Coches are built on, on natural landscapes and uh, landscape depressions with small dams made of soil and rocks. And they enable the storage of, of rainwater or surface waters like I said, facilitating the infiltration of water to recharge aquifers and rivers and lakes and so on downhill. The kinds of practices that Ochoa Tukachi and colleagues have highlighted are important to upscale today. But coches also endure over generations. And they're built by forefathers and then the infrastructure is maintained over generations and this includes all the, the canals and the levees and the ditches and so on. Um, and this process is known as coche chapai, guarding the coches. So coches aren't something that are simply implemented as part of a project and, and then the job is done. These main, they are maintained by intergenerational relationships. And these Kemak and this, this photo have built their own kocha. There's actually a complex story behind this photograph about the fleeting nature of adaptation programs. Um, so while PAC Peru um, presents some of the cases in, in Pukukancha, this community is a success story. These Kemak have a different take on how coaches have been revived and how they're managed in their communities, but something I'll have to leave aside for today. The third aspect of, of PAC's um, list of priorities, I want to shift here to make the links between water management and pastoral management, is pastoral rotation. As I mentioned earlier, that the wet infrastructure that were maintained prior to the Inca were important for, for conserving water. And pasture rotation has often has long been important in this relationship. And the historic practices of a camayoc of training other farmers in pasture rotation are important. Of course, that's often happened with corrals and stone walls and so on. But more recently, adaptation program and programs are advocating the use of, of fences. And it's not the fences per se that um, I will talk about a little bit later, but it's about the ways in which they are introduced and managed through new kinds of community agreements. These community agreements invoke Andean custom of managing the commons, for example, but they're mostly focused on intra-community relations, as in um, how to manage uh, albaca herding in one community. And as I'll show later, the role of Kamayak um, reveals a different set of relationships, meaning we need to think about inter-community relations um, across um, Andean space. Uh, so I'll come back to this particular example in a, in a moment just to unpack a bit more detail. But to further the links to, to pastoral management, PAC Peru also highlights animal husbandry. And to do that, they also advocate the revival of the, the Andean pastoralist calendar and various practices aligned with that. In the month of Kamai, for example, the best alpaca from communities is selected and sacrificed to the local apus. Apus are sacred mountains, deities. This is a ceremony led by water and alpaca Kamayok. This ritual of providing the blood of alpacas to fertilize the land and to irrigate the pastures is part of Andean animistic rituals of reciprocal gifting. And the word, or oh, the Quechua word for reciprocal gifting is yanka, um, which of course relates to the yanka kamayok I've mentioned a couple of times. And so by sacrificing the alpaca and offering its heart, the local apus, these sacred mountains, would provide water for the earth and for animals. While an alpaca-shaped animating constellation known as the yakana um, would infuse species vitality in earthly alpacas and ensure the flow, the hydrocosmological flows of water, which I will explain in one moment. But of course, these kind of practices invoke that historic understanding of the role of Kamayak in leading these ceremonies in order to appease the apus for both um, healthy hydrocosmological flows, but also healthy earthly alpacas. And in some of the complexity of these relationships that have existed for centuries, 
that I wanted to touch on because it points to some of the challenges of linking these ontologies of the Andean living world to modern adaptation programming. And, and this is where I want to begin addressing some of the challenges of linking Kamayok with these contemporary programs. So to do that, I'm gonna focus on some issues of translating the Andean living world into adaptation programming. And, and I think identifying and addressing some of these challenges also opens up new opportunities. And so I'll follow the lead of some Kamayok here in highlighting some possible new directions, particularly around the, um, the ideas of intercultural knowledge exchange across Indian space that can move us beyond this sort of project by project understanding of how adaptation might work. So the first challenge I wanted to want to discuss is this ontological issue of connecting the Andean living world to the arguably technocratic world of adaptation programming. I've written about this in, in some other ways and in a bit more detail with uh, long-term collaborator of mine, Justina Nunez Nunez, and I'm happy to share this paper as well, if, if it's of any interest. But it's worth coming back here to the word Kamayok itself. The word Kamai means to animate, to transform, or to give charge to. And adding the ok suffix lends an individual the ability to mobilize this verb. That means that Kamayok are agents of animation or of giving charge to. And as agents of animation, they're responsible for giving charge to the earthly components of the Andean living world. That is the engagements among humans, non-humans, and the sentient beings or deities, the apus. Take, for example, the connections of Kamayak to the animating forces of this yakana, which I mentioned before. It's actually superimposed above this Kamayak in the sky. Obviously, that's not the real sky. Uh, you might be able to make it out depending on how clear your zoom screen is, there's an alpaca shaped constellation in the sky there that's the Yakana, that animating force that gives vitalizing energies to earthly alpacas. So it's an animator or a Kamakin. And Kamayok have been and are responsible for articulating the animating powers and vitalizing powers of this Yakana, both to infuse species vitality in earthly alpacas and to ensure hydrocosmological flows. So to draw on a, on a famous account of pre-Hispanic uh, rituals, rites and rituals, when the Yakana des descends to earth, it drinks from the springs, bringing water from below the earth. And in the middle of the night, when nobody's aware of it, the Yakana drinks all the water out of the ocean. If the Yakana failed to drink, the waters would quickly drown the whole world. So it's, it's important to keep the Yakana um, at work, if you like. And these, these rituals and these social cultural dynamics that Kamayok are involved in are part of this idea of, of keeping the Yakana circulating water. So the Yakana is an animator of hydrological cycles, and Kamayok have long been responsible for harnessing these animating powers to ensure that pastures are consistently irrigated, groundwater supplies are refreshed, and cockchas are topped up so that alpacas can feed and drink healthily. So just to demonstrate the significance of this relationship a little bit more, I want to draw on here a, a diagram that Rutger Bolens has, has produced from some of his work. He's been working on, on water and irrigation issues in the Andes for decades. We can see here the Yakana in the top left of this diagram, sort of managing flows of energy and flows of water between the, the above world, Hanak Pacha, um, there's the, the constellations, of the world of, of humans and non-humans of Kaipacha and the underground world Ukupacha. Uh, the water is central to the, these hydrocosmological cycles. And actually in this diagram, Ruka Bolens has included all of the cultures and the irrigated fields and so on that Kamak have long been important for upholding. Those that patchwork pattern on the diagram is those irrigated plots. He's also included canal intakes and the coches and the kinds of canals that Kamayok have long been important for upholding. So we see here how central Kamayok are to upholding these hydropastoral and these hydrocosmological engagements in linking the Yakana to flows of water in Kaipacha, the, the world of the humans and non-humans on ground. And Andean concepts here, like these these cyclical concepts are recursive, which means they're continuous and non-linear. Andean concepts of time are also non-linear. And this is what 
decolonial scholar and activist Grimaldo Ringifo calls the perennial continuity of Andean regenerative activities. This means that Kamak who practiced hydropastoral um, management in pre-Inca societies and Kamayaku practice similar hydropastoral management and adaptation programs today are equally important for upholding these hydrocosmological flows. They, they can't be detached in a linear sense of time like, like we might in an understanding um, time through Western cultures. So given these relationships and, and including that concept of time, how can we reconcile this with the arguably technocratic and linear world of adaptation programming, which is designed to sort of respond to um, changing environments, both discrete events and ongoing change, but in a largely linear way. <clears throat> I'm drawing on Marcus Taylor's work here from Queen's University, who discusses the world of adaptation. How can we reconcile this Andean living world with the world of adaptation? Do we even need to reconcile them? I'm going to quote Marcus Taylor here in his, his work where he just, he highlights how adaptation programming keeps climate and society as separate um, with the climate posed as an external threat to society. And this is key to, and I quote, creating a world of adaptation as a field of governmentality in which all aspects of society are portrayed as necessarily adapting to cli external climatic stimuli, end quote. So this world of adaptation is, is also needed to justify the interventions associated with the adaptation programs like PAC Peru and to justify the inclusion of Kamayak in those programs. And yet it can also contradict these um, Quechua animist ontologies of hydrocosmological cycles because it frames water management as a discrete field of management as separated from these hydrocosmological flows. It frames water management as an, an adaptive need in response to an out there environmental change. So while adaptation programming sometimes includes discrete or distinct Andean ceremonies, like some of the ones I mentioned before, into its planning logic, do they reflect the perennial continuity of Andean regenerative activities that Cremelda Rinkifo has pointed to? And if so, how can this be understood in adaptation terms? I would say that the adaptation paradigm as a whole reproduces the conceptual detachment of regenerative activities through these hydrocosmological flows from an externalized nature, and that this has social and material consequences, some of which I'll be touching on. And I don't necessarily have a solution to, to some of these challenges, and I don't mean to imply that we need to somehow fully reconcile the adaptation world with the Andean living world. Um, I don't think they need to be commensurable, that it's collapsed into each other. They can be understood separately. And this is where I think the role of the camera comes in, and I'll come back to this, but I'm going to take a lead from them in looking at the ways in which Iskai Yachai, as a reciprocal form of knowledge exchange, can help make the links between this adaptation world and this Andean animist world. But before I do so, just some of the social and material consequences of some of this, um, some of these challenges. And I want to unpack a bit further here the limits to translating the Andean living world into adaptation programming. Sorry. So and I'll come back to the fences that I that I included, I mentioned earlier, and the fence here that Maribel is, is standing in front of. The the idea of using fences to manage pastures isn't new, of course. Um, and it's an, an idea introduced by adaptation programs while discursively invoking similar Andean environmental practices using the stone walls and corrals and so on. It's not the fence per se that's at, uh, that it's at stake here, I think, but it's the relationships behind the fence and the forms of community uh, agreements that are implemented or introduced by adaptation programs that are of interest. So some Kamayak argue that the new types of fences and the ways in which they're managed and implemented actually run counter so, to some of the existing social cultural institutions for managing the commons. So in 2018, I had a conversation with Melinda Kispe, it's not her real name, but she's an alpacaero from the Aymaras district in, in Aparimac. We discussed the challenges of, of developing new norms around herding and fencing. So having gone to great lengths, um, including hiring laborers and establishing an association 
to build a fence in line with recommendations from an NGO, Melinda's community pastures are actually under increased stress. She argues that for some alpaqueros, the fence symbolizes an abolishment of previous norms concerning herding practices and collective pasture management. There's no respect for this fence, she says. Everyone's driving their alpacas and their llamas here, even those who live far away. We used to understand where we could herd our animals. With this fence, people are confused. The old way no longer works. They think there is a new system. So while the adaptation program invokes traditional Andean practices of managing the commons, it's also introducing new or social relations, which can be confusing to some pastoralists. It's not really the, the aspect of those far away, as I've highlighted here, moving around and, and herding their alpacas, perhaps close to other people's herds. It's actually about the, whether or not this is an accepted practice and who gets a say over these pastoral practices. And this is because community level authority in governing the commons is established through Andean customs of rotational service and through ceremony. So Apus, the sacred mountains, for example, choose to delegate authority to humans. And that is established through ceremony. So when an adaptation program um, advocates introducing new fences and new kinds of community agreements, they don't always um, arrive at those agreements through ceremony, which means that for some alpaqueros and, and other um, campesinos and farmers in the Andean living world, those agreements are meaningless. These externally determined and politicized notions of community and community form and function that are introduced by the projects are ignored by these other farmers who work through ceremony. And this is why it's an issue of translating the Andean living world into adaptation logics. So in Melinda's case, groups of alpaca herders are ignoring the new boundaries that are introduced by the adaptation programming. And she argues that this new politicized rules are undermining established customs for managing the commons and respecting authority, which comes through ceremony from Apus. There's actually quite a long history of the ways in which um, Quechua communities have ignored boundaries that are introduced, including by the state and so on. But programs such as PAC conclude that the key to success of adaptation programming in terms of hydropastoralism is to develop new understandings and respect for community agreements. Yet if these community agreements are endorsed by some but not all members of the human and non-human living community, then it's likely that they will continue to be ignored. And just to unpack that a bit further, I'll come back to some of Rupka Bolens' work. He describes Andean communities as arenas where diverse actors negotiate and coalesce to agree among diverse interests and determine the rights, rules, and conditions under which resource management strategies are going to be realized. This basically just means it's complex, it's built over time, and it's built over generations. And rapidly introducing new ideas about what community is and what community agreements might entail doesn't necessarily attend to this complexity of how they've been developed over time. So tensions around introduced fencing, I would say, are more than a technical issue to be fixed with new community agreements and different fencing arrangements. It reflects some of the ontological politics that comes with adaptation programming um, in connecting with the Andean living world. And this is where I think come out have a role to play because it's not necessarily just about new intra-community relationships about pastoralism. It's about the ways in which different communities across Andean space are engaged in hydropastoral management in response to environmental change. And so this is where I'll come to some opportunities. I, I wanna focus here on Andean understandings of the collective and of relationships within the collective, and that's both human and non-human connections. They're not constrained by space in the ways in which we might understand communities in many Western cultures. By the way, I use this photo because this Kamoyak is a key individual in a Kamoyak association and an alpaca herding association and an artisanal cooperative. But the opportunities here are about the roles of Kamoyak, not just as harborers of knowledge, nor just as intermediaries in these development and adaptation programs, but they're key actors in it upholding community reciprocal relations. And like Kevin Lane's point about communitized water control in pre-Inca societies, community here stretches across regions. So, and they also evolve across time. 
So the community agreements introduced by PEC are not necessarily the same as the community relations that Kamayak have upheld for centuries. Kamayak have highlighted the revival uh, of water committees and hydropastoral associations to connect water-related demands across communities, cultural groups, and water user groups. Take, for example, oh, sorry, I forgot to put the bullet points up. Take, for example, Alejandra and Rosalind, who've established hydropastoral agreements and built complex, diverse um, hydropastoral systems that combine open irrigation, rotational pasture, sprinkler systems, and reforestation, all with an understanding that infiltrating water can replenish groundwater supplies, including lakes and rivers downhill, like those historic practices that some recent academic literature has pointed to. Kamayak work, in this sense, is and always has been precisely oriented around inter-community co-learning for the benefit of the Southern Andean region as a whole. It always integrated knowledge systems, production systems, and social cultural dynamics across regions. And I've written about that elsewhere in the historic piece. So there's connecting communities across Andean space for integrated production and co-nurturance of the Andean living world is central to Kamayak work. And one way in which this is articulated is through um, the reciprocal dialogue among multiple knowledges. And so what does all this have to do with adaptation? Well, and helping to establish and support associations of hydropastoral relations, can I work through this notion of Iskai Yacha? Um, it, the notion of a couple of pairs of knowledge here overlaps with other Quechua understandings of complementarity and reciprocity. They're not commensurable, like I mentioned earlier. You don't need to have these two knowledge systems collapse into one single whole. You can keep them separate, but they do need to engage in respectful and reciprocal dialogue. So the Andean hydrocosmologies don't need to be collapsed into a and a more contemporary adaptation program. You can keep them separate so long as there is dialogue amongst these knowledge systems. And this is important at at least two levels, I think, for today. One, Iskayache can uphold um, hydrosocial and hydropastoral territories that span social and cultural groups and geographies in the Andes, both Quechua and non Quechua. Remember that Kemoyok um, have long been important for upholding uh, water management practices that span valleys and resource users. And embedding Iskayache, I think, enables emerging associations to work on a similar basis. Second, Iskai Yachai embeds interculturality in adaptation programming, and Iskai Yachai changes the terms of the conversation about what adaptation means, away from technical solutions for, to biophysical hazards, towards long-term reciprocal dialogues on the ways in which diverse knowledges can work through Andean ways of understanding, experiencing, and knowing the Andean living world. So in the title, I, I call this Beyond Adaptation because I think it, adaptation is increasingly programmatic, it's increasing, increasingly linear, and it divides the world up into discrete sections and sectors. <clears throat> Focusing on Iskai Yachai, I think, in upholding co-nurturing relations <clears throat> in the Andean living world, highlights interconnectivity, reciprocity, and ongoing recursive processes of engaging with environmental change. And I've run out of time, I think, so I'm just gonna wrap up. Um, I've highlighted the, the role of Iskai Yachai, I would like to talk about it a little bit more, but in re-embedding hydropastoral territorial control. And I think there are implications for some of this, and some of these conclusions are fairly early on in, in development. Um, uh, I hope to keep working on them, but I think <clears throat> they also point us towards the role of interculturality, not just in adaptation programming, but in indigenous stewardship programs more generally in the context of environmental change. They also raise questions about a decolonial climate change politics. Um, this overlaps with some recent work that's coming through in the critical work on adaptation. For example, Siri Erickson and some of her colleagues, many of her colleagues actually, have been advocating the term post-adaptation. This may or may not um, overlap with a decolonial climate change politics, but there are questions about the role that Kama might may play here. If decoloniality um, to be defended cannot be funded, as Walter Mingolo has argued, then what does it mean when Kamayak are trained by NGOs and by the state within adaptation programs? Can they uphold a decolonial climate change politics? And apologies that that conclusion is rather rapid, a little bit brief, but, um, and if there's interest in questions, I can link that to some of my current work um, 
in building my DECRA project, but for now I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just acknowledge some of the, just a few of the many individuals and organizations that have um, helped support this, this research over the last years. Otherwise I'll, I'll leave it for, for now. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Julian. Should and I stop sharing all that wrong? Yeah, Can please, if you could do this, that'd be great. Thank you. And, and Julian, your, your last point, I'm, I'm not even sure you realize how closely um, aligned your research interest is to some of the interests around this virtual room here, uh, thinking creatively about, you know, the governing of the commons, right? How we can rely on and involve communities in those processes. You know, probably don't have to mention water in this um, virtual room here. You know, so there's so many things that, that we struggle with as well. You know, um, you, you gave us this fascinating lens of the Andes and you know, the practices and the, and the historic legacy of looking after land and water. But I think it, it resonates strongly with comparative and, and from a comparative lens to, to think creatively about um, cl climate change in a decolonial key, if you want to call it this way. Um, before I open uh, up the, um, the session for the Q&A uh, part of today's um, Global Talks, let me just remind people around this virtual call here that on uh, Wednesday next week, we're going to have a, a showcase of our projects at the center for which we need a bit more time. So we start at 10 o'clock. So just you know, keep this in your calendars for next week. And, and also very quickly, and we will have more time for doing this, um, I would like to also um, welcome uh, Tamara Plush and Andrew Buck, you know, here on the call, I think they're still on, uh, who have joined the, the center as a Sodius Fellows. So, you know, we will have more time on, uh, on Wednesday to welcome them more fully and, uh, and also Tamara and Andrew to introduce you to, to us as a community uh, at the Center for Global Studies. With this, um, please be welcome to come up with your comments, questions for Julian, who would like to start us off. I can see some of the call here uh, have a strong stake in particular in community engaged research. So I think, you know, the approaches that Julian has taken also uh, engaging in and, and trying to understand the communities he speaks with. Oh, here, I don't have to mention water for very long, you know, before Oliver comes on. <laughs> Oliver. I tried to give a bit of a pause to let others get in, but I, I didn't <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> poor Julian to feel like nobody was listening. So I thought I'd, I'd step up to the plate. So fabulous talk. Thank you, Julian. I'm Oliver Brandis. And um, so uh, my question, I'm going to kind of come at it from a really practical angle and sort of say that one of the big challenges we're seeing in certainly the BC context or the Canadian context is the sort of translation of indigenous knowledge and then coupled with exertion of indigenous authority to then influence whether it's crown institutions or, you know, we're fortunate in BC, we have some interesting co-governance, so multi-authority, multi-juridical kinds of settings, but the sort of knowledge system, the sort of epistemology is quite different, and so that has trouble translating, and so, so that's a little background, and so I'm really interested in you know, what I would call a, what I saw in a glimpse, there are a bunch of really practical interventions that are based on indigenous knowledge and it, his, uh, indigenous authority and uh, indigenous governance. How does that translate into practices beyond the exertion by the indigenous people, presumably in territories they have some control? Is there a flow or a evolution, let's say, of some of the institutions to allow that to happen? What could we in Canada learn from that? Or is that sort of early? And my last sort of related nugget is a, a fascinating reminder because in my early days, I worked in the Ecuadorian uh, Paramo doing climate analysis, round water, not surprising, in the context of what does the science say in comparison to some of like the fieldwork science to what uh, some of the indigenous partners were sort of alluding to, and this was 20, 25 years ago, and they were surprisingly right on, but the science was way slower. Um, you actually rolled a few questions into one there, I think, think Oliver. Um, I'll start with, I guess, is there, is there a flow from um, these traditional practices into the institutions, I suppose? And I'll start by saying that authority is perhaps a little bit 
um, different in the way in which that's, it's articulated in the Peruvian Andes and the context of indigenous organizing and of uh, recognizing um, plurinational states is quite different in the Andes. Um, you don't have the same conversations around indigenous autonomy or sovereignty that you might in Canada, partly because of the ways in which the word indigenous has been so politicized, um, historically speaking, in, in the Andes. So you often actually see more um, engagement around authority of, of Andean and Quechua uh, cultures and agrarian practices than you might around an indigenous politics per se. Um, and it's partly because, um, well, I'll leave that there, I think, for this talk today, but is there a flow? I'll, I'll give a little example of, of um, how these flows might occur. When I first started my research back in around 2009, that was when the, the Peruvian government launched their approach to trying to um, certify the knowledges of various rural actors, including Kamayok. Uh, over the course of 2009 to 2013, I did research in collaboration with those state agencies and with NGOs and with Kamayok. And one of the outcomes that came from it was that the, the programs were focusing, focusing so much on technical knowledges that it was actually creating some, some contestation and some rifts among Kamayok as well as other groups about what it means to have their knowledges certified and their practices certified by the state. And, and what that means in terms of whose knowledge gets to be Kamayok knowledge or what knowledge gets to be Kamayok knowledge and what doesn't. And so, um, and I don't want to claim to be the sole instigator of this, but through conversations with others as well, we were talking about how the cultural aspects get incorporated into the certification of knowledges, which is quite a, obviously quite a technocratic thing. You've got to write down what knowledge is or, or is not. Um, and, and that contradicts Quechua understandings of knowledge, which are oral anyway. And so the whole process obviously um, is sort of reductive in terms of how Andean cultures uh, transfer knowledge across generations. But we had conversations about well, what's the cultural dynamic that could come through here. And so then over time, this state institution, IPEBA, as it was called then, started to develop new training manuals around maintaining cultures um, across generations in knowledge transfer. And so they started to think about well, how do we actually train individuals and families to actually guard knowledge over generations um, and through time, rather than just think about certifying these sort of technocratic um, aspect of, do they know how to build a kocha, for example, or whatever it might be. So is there a flow? I think there is a flow, but the context looks quite different to what it does in Canada. Code governance um, isn't a model that is necessarily um, worked with in the Peruvian Andes, but there are broader understandings of intercultural and bilingual development um, and education that are sort of the organizing principles in the end is that there aren't these necessarily these formal roots of, of co-governance in the way that which you might see here. Having said that, they do have other sort of participatory and deliberative mechanisms, but those aren't about, um, they're not about, say, date sitting down with indigenous groups, it's actually done on a sort of spatial basis depending on municipalities and so on. So it's sort of outside of that, that line of work. Um, I'm forgetting what your other parts of your questions were at the moment, but interestingly, oh, you asked about, uh, is there something to learn? I'm gonna flip that around, I think actually. Um, Peru has been learning from Canada and Australia. One of the reasons that some of my current interests and, and the current project I'm building is working with indigenous rangers in, in Australia and with indigenous guardians in, in Canada is because the Peruvian government actually looked to cases in Australia and Canada and elsewhere when it was building its certification program. They wanted to know how indigenous knowledges were being mobilized within um, government approved or, or, or government developed environmental management and governance systems. And so there's actually some links that have already been developed there as the Peruvian government has been surveying the territory and trying to incorporate lessons from, from elsewhere. So that's led to some of my, my current work. Um, not sure I answered your questions particularly bang on, but um, I've forgotten what the rest of your question was, so I'll have to stop. Oh, that's wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Um, I, I saw, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, Andrew, uh, started your camera. Was this an indication that you wanted to ask a question, Andrew, or? 
If not, you know, no worries. Okay. Yes, thank you. It was an indication. No, right on, here you go. Do you want to, better, in, in two, two sentences, just introduce yourself to the rest of the group and then you, we have a more full introduction of you, you know, next week. Thanks, Oliver. Um, well, I'm Andrew Buck and um, for the last few years I've been teaching across um, both the law school and the Department of History um, on legal history and most recently on the legal history of dispossession. Um, I had a question, Julian, as, as your talk was going on, which was absolutely fabulous, it was about the fences. And I wonder if you could, A, say a little bit more about where the idea of the, putting the fences up came from in the first place, what was driving that? And, and secondly, um, I'd be fascinated to know about the, the legal context of the land that these commons are on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what's the relationship between the Peruvian state and, and these commons? Um, who owns it <laughs> or who doesn't own it? Um, what, you know, if you could just explore that a little bit for me, that would be wonderful. Yeah, sure. It's really complicated. Um, the, the first question, though, it came from a logic of conservationism, really. The idea that, you know, you put fences around something, you conserve it for a while and it rejuvenates and then you can move the fences and rejuvenate another part of the pastures. And so it was really just a conservationist idea about we can't have uh, too many alpacas in a certain amount of space. Otherwise, they eat all the grass and the water um, infiltrates too fast or turns into overland flows. And then they combine that with the idea, well, actually pastoralists have been doing this sort of pastoral management for centuries. So um, putting these fences in isn't anything new necessarily in terms of the practice of pastoralism, but we want to embed it as a sort of new institutional norm with the support of various NGOs and municipalities and government agencies, including the PAC projects. So as to create a, a great, create a more formal understanding that these fences mean something in terms of conservation. I don't know if you were picked up, but I had a, an image at one point of a, of a sign that was put up in Aparimac about the goals of the PAC Peru project. It's in Spanish, but basically it, it's all highlighted around education for environmental conservation. So what they were trying to do is take this conservationist logic, um, marry it with existing practices of pastoral management of moving you know our packets around different sectors of the andes as a form of education to change the ways in why to change the reasons why our packer herders might move or respect um, preserved pasture spaces it doesn't work for various reasons in some places because precisely for the reasons i mentioned in the talk that um, if you introduce this conservationist logic and it doesn't align with existing sort of social or cultural norms for, for who and who cannot herd in certain places, then, then they may not respect those fences. And you can drive around the Andes, even close to the highway, you can even see some of these fences, you know, pulled down. Whether they're pulled down by weather or humans or animals, I don't know, but, you know, they're not working that well in a lot of areas. Um, the second question, I, I'm not a legal scholar or historian. Um, so this will be a bit partial, but who owns the land? That's a human and a modern human question, I think, in the Andes. Um, humans are, are on the land and that they are allowed to be on the land in relationship with, with Apus, the sacred mountains. And, and there's quite a lot of um, cultural dynamics around what happens when an Apus get angry, including causing lands, landslides and avalanches and so on. And so there's an animist Andean on, uh, understanding of how to live in the world in the Andes. That's one thing. And then there's a, there's a colonial um, understanding of ownership that was introduced with the reducciones, which were the ways in which Andean populations were taken from um, just dispersed households and put into villages and towns by the Spanish for the purposes of organizing uh, colonial control. That didn't mean that the surrounding areas became crown land 
as which would be the comparison to settler colonial context here in Canada. Um, this still was the commons in the sense that and Peru is organized sort of vertically in altitude. So it's always commons above about three and a half thousand meters because alpacas can only really exist in that space and nothing else really exists in that space. So everyone's allowed to graze their alpacas across this space in the commons. But there are norms and institutions for governing who grazes where and why and how. Um, there's also ownership over herds, however. So an individual farmer can have a herd, but they're responsible for sharing that herd in the sense of sharing some of the, the best um, breeding males. Um, and, and this sort of comes from a, a historic practice of separating royal herds from community herds as well. So there, there are processes of managing one's own herd, but also being responsible for sharing that herd. And none of that's changed either in a legal sense necessarily. There, there's nothing to say that, um, uh, as, well, I mean, it's quite complicated. When, when an alpaca herders grow or raise alpacas and sell the wool to a, a textile company, for example, they collectivize their wool. It's not about an individual having a contract with an intermediary who has a contract with um, a textile company. So it's, it's not a direct answer to your question once again, but it, it's complicated in the sense that some of these customary norms and ideas of the commons have not been eroded by private property rights entirely in the Andes because I, th I think partly because there's been such a strong sense of who these Southern Quechua peoples are and the sense of management across generations is so strong, coming I think from some of the organizational principles of the Inca state that, and also combining that with the idea that well, Spanish colonization wasn't like British colonization, for example, they didn't try to just destroy everything. They were very much focused on um, working with indigenous institutions and management processes and so I think over time, obviously you see erasure and erosion of indigenous um, cultures and practices with Spanish colonization, but you also see the ways in which they get enrolled together and evolve in, over time. And, and so I think that means you, you have this combination of ideas around private property, but practices of, of communal management in the Andes. Um, and it's the best I can do, I think. No, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. I, mean, I, I suppose, you know, the, your answer it is also illustrates how complex and challenging it is to think about communal stewardship of the land in the language of our private property laws and you know, an understanding of property, right? And so it's, uh, I think that it is so complicated it is a reflection of a reality or clashes of understandings of how proper ownership and governments of the land ought to function. So I have, I think Juan Francisco, you know, you're next and then Amy um, uh, for questions. Juan Francisco first. Oh, sure. Um, thank you, Julian. That was a really great presentation. I'm from Peru. So watching the, looking at the pictures that you used in your slides were like really nice thing. I was really missing uh, home. Um, I so I, I, I had a couple of questions related also to notions of territory and land, right? So I maybe kind of like trying to complement your answer to the previous question is like kind of like Peruvian government has always had this idea of land as being an economic asset, right? So when creating communities, they didn't care much about, you know, territories or culture or kind of like ethnicity. They care about giving to groups of people specific parts of land that were just for economic purposes, right? So it was wondering besides the idea of fences whether these legal boundaries between communities also like uh, from what you've seen like undermine um some kind of like these cultural practices around like managing like water bodies etc right so that's kind of like the first one besides the fences is kind of like legal boundaries between communities um the other one was out, kind of like a bit of the perception. I don't know if you managed to get uh, an idea and talk to, you know, you, you said you talked to government officials and NGO representatives. So I wanted to know a bit their perception about this indigenous knowledge, because kind of like in some places I've seen NGOs engage with local leaders more for purposes of legitimizing their projects rather than really considering this indigenous local knowledge, knowledge or something like valuable. So I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that if it's kind of like a recognition that this is important like really useful valuable knowledge or it's more like 
I just want to legitimize my project and be there, right? Um, and the third thing I wanted to mention is that I, I, I did, um, I was a trainee in the office that uh, used to register this collective knowledge in 2007, between 2005 and seven. So it was funny. I remember that at that time, kind of like the main problem that the government was trying to address is some pharmaceuticals patenting some, the use of certain plants used by indigenous uh, groups. But then things got really complicated because you have this issue that some knowledge is not held by a specific nation, but it's held by many nations. And then notions about trying to put this logic of intellectual property into something that is collective was also one of the problems that we're we were facing at that point. I worked there only six months, so I don't know exactly what happened afterwards, but it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned. So those are kind of like my two main questions, the community boundaries and perception from NGOs and governments. Thank you. Yeah, to, if I can take the second one first about whether they're legitimizing a project or whether they really value indigenous knowledges, I think both things are going on. And I'll start with a bit more context about this work in the Andes, which has been going on for decades. And, and, and there's lots of different groups um, working on the idea of agrarian knowledges and Quechua understandings of, of ecology. Um, including some quite radical groups that advocate a return to agrarian society in the Andes. Um, and and those, they are fully in support of Quechua principles around, you know, animist ontologies and so on. There are other NGOs that are sort of, um, well, okay, that's one thing. There's, there are other sets of NGOs that are international NGOs, like some of those that I've worked with who have understandings of indigenous knowledges, but ultimately are working with development program sort of goals and objectives. And so you often end up with a process of what Tanya Lee calls a rendering technical. You take a cultural or political issue that might be relating to indigenous knowledge and you transform it into a technical thing because you can report on it and you can resolve it because you've already got the skills to do so. And then there's the government, which, um, and as you know, the, the Peruvian government is quite fleeting. For five years, they'll do one thing. For five, next five years, they'll do something entirely different. Um, let's not get into the politics of Peru at the moment, I suppose. But, and, and so they're learning as institutions. And, and the institutions that I was working with were set up to reform adult education. So they're, they're thinking about how do we professionalize people so that they can get jobs. Um, that was one of their goals. The other goal was how do we improve agricultural production in the Andes to increase value and to export Andean products. So they're legitimizing their project because they want to incorporate indigenous knowledges because they want the reform process to succeed and they want to increase value production from Andean goods and services. However, people are complex, institutions are complex and made up of lots of different people. And so when you speak to individuals, they're very much on a personal basis, respectful of and aware of and, and want to be true to indigenous knowledges, but they work within a system that ultimately has technical goals towards adult education reform or exports or, or what have you. So, I just wanted to make that distinction because it's not like individuals are sitting down and saying, how do we make this indigenous knowledge more technical for the purposes of X, Y, Z? It's because of the ways in which the systems evolved over time, which obviously in Peru has meant generations of, of excluding Quechua knowledge systems for all sorts of complex historical reasons. Um, so that was my answer to that one. The legal boundaries and so on, like I said before, I'm not a legal scholar, so I don't want to speak out of turn, but what I can say is that at times you start to see tensions emerging, not necessarily because the, the legal boundaries between communities, but because of the ways in which, I suppose it, it's the ways in which different understandings of community um, come together sometimes. And, and that can mean that when there's a, a physical community in a spatial sense um, where people live, doesn't always overlap or reconcile with the social relationships of community that might extend out beyond those communities. And, and that's the kind of tension that I see emerge quite frequently in the Andes. But there's another one that I'm starting to do research on and that's around mining. And obviously mining involves partitioning the land up 
into all these mining concessions. And the map of Aparimac is kind of crazy in terms of the mining concessions that exist across the department. Something like 78% of the land in Aparimac actually has mining concessions attached to it. It doesn't mean there's active mining there, obviously, as you know, but the Peruvian government can sell that concession or lease that concession to a mining company if it wants to. And so some of the tensions that I've also seen emerge are around what it means when mining companies start to get interested in mining concessions. And so they've obviously got an understanding of what a plot of land might mean in terms of that mining concession. And then they have to try and negotiate with different communities about um, the social right to exist in that space and to perhaps practice their mining um, in that area. And, and, and I've seen some mining companies, you might be familiar with Buenaventura, which is quite a large mining company in Peru. They, they actually implement a lot of social projects and development projects to try and engage communities before they start their mining projects because they realize that, well, just because the government's leased a concession to us, it doesn't mean that the communities here are gonna understand or agree with the ways in which the, those concessions are mapped and leased and so on and so forth. So that's something that, just an observation for now. Yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you. And, and I would like to add about those mining concessions. It's like sometimes these concessions are given to a company and the community has no idea that they have been given, right? So yeah. they never know and realize, they just figure out when just the company suddenly appears. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Kind of like a way to Niels, I should take you, the two of you to lunch and listen in on what's happening in Peru and you know, what a really great conversation. Alas, you know, different time. Um, looking at the time, I would suggest that we take Amy's, uh, Amy's uh, Yuta's and also Ben's question and then we come back to you, Julie, and then you can pick the easiest question to answer or, you know, address those if we still have time for. Um, Amy, you're next. Thanks so much, Julian. This was a really terrific talk. I'm uh, just starting a postdoc remotely at UBC, and I came from a department, a political science department, University of Toronto, where there's a lot of potential for community engaged research, but uh, not a lot currently happening in the department. So I, I wondered if you could talk about what was required to do this kind of research well, the kind of institutional support that you needed and tensions around maybe timelines or developing research agendas, you know, in partnership with community partners and satisfying the, the institutional requirements and that kind of thing. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for thank, the thank question. You. Julian, would you mind to hold yeah. off and uh, just, yeah, just sure. you know, get the other questions <laughs> in so we give everybody, if, you know, wants to, to uh, bring, get in his or her question. Uh, Jutta. Yes, thank you. That was an amazing talk, Julian. Thank you. Actually, one of my questions you have already answered, which was about mining. Uh, but my other question is about uh, the relationship between the rural and the urban and how much the knowledge, that indigenous knowledge on water management and conservation actually translates into water management in the cities, which so depends on what happens in the hinterland. That's a condensed question. <laughs> Thank you, Yudana. I'm sure you, you could speak to, uh, to Amy's questions of, as well, the, the challenges of doing community-engaged research. You know, we, I think we need a special session on this at some stage. Um, Be Benjamin, you know, um, do you want to raise your question? You, you left it in the chat box, you know, basically focusing on the meaning of intercultural learning in Julian's talk. Uh, ben, do you want to come in and, and raise us, or should we just read it? Hello, Julian. <laughs> nice to hear your voice, Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Oliver. And my question is, uh, you developed the concept of intercultural learning. So my question is, what are the limits of this inter, this between? What are the limits of this interrelation of uh, inter-exchange? Uh, do you mean by intercultural learning, a co-building with a respect of each identity? So they are separate. The identities are separated, but they co cooperate together for common points, or, uh, or it's a co-building with uh, one unitary fusional governance. You know what I mean? I would like you to develop more about these limits of this exchange, of these interrelations. Thank you very much, Julian. Julian, you have six or seven minutes to, you know, you, you go ahead, you know, uh, looking at these three 
Uh, not really interrelated question, but you know, all kind of great points related to your talk. You go ahead. Thanks, Albert. <clears throat> Amy, that, that is a really complicated question, and, and I don't think six minutes is going to do it justice. Um, I, I was quite lucky in this Peruvian context, I would say, but having some um, established relationships through some of my work with Psilocybin's Practicas, and that's where I began. And I already knew about what they were doing in working with Camayoc, and I basically started there. And then I just tried to figure out relationships from that point outwards. Um, and it's evolved over time and I've, I've become um, less aligned with Solucionist practices for various reasons. And I've become more aligned with certain camera groups um, versus others for various reasons. I don't think there's a black and white um, approach to community engaged re research and the ethics concerning community engaged research. It changes over time as you as a researcher learn and you, you respond to social relationships, timelines. Um, I don't know if I can answer that in a six minute question. I, I, I've been building this research over the last 10 years, but obviously I had to set something up for my PhD and that, that relied on agreements with Solution and Practicas and with some um, Camayo communities. And then later on with some of those state agencies that were involved in training Kamayak. Um, and so obviously I had to get some of those agreements in place um, for formal ethics approval with UBC and so on. Um, formal ethics approval, I'm um, going beyond the six minutes here, I'd say, but formal ethics approval is one thing, but the deep ethics of your own research project and engagement is another thing. And uh, I'll just leave that for today. Um, Yuta, um, that's a great question. And um, actually the, the literature around hydrosocial territories is, is often oriented towards that very issue about the role urban linkages of water. Um, about the translation of indigenous knowledges from rural to urban, I, I don't know too much about that. And, and I'm thinking urban here is beyond, uh, you know, there are quite a lot of small villages or towns in the Andes. Um, I'm not sure I, I would call those necessarily urban. I'm thinking sort of the bigger towns. I think there might be some literature about that. I would have to have a look into that. But normally the, the discussions are about actually what happens when water uh, flows and what does that mean in terms of the impacts on say a rural community when water flows to an urban area to meet certain urban water demands and needs. Um, I haven't seen too much about the idea of, of translating indigenous um, water management practices into the urban context. There are some examples around Cusco, so sort of in the hinterland around Cusco, but they're definitely peri-urban rather than urban, and they're probably actually more rural than they are peri-urban, and so they're developing these water management practices in areas that will be urbanizing for sure over coming years as Cusco expands, and so I think what will be interesting to see is probably how in, in the hillsides, you'll see indigenous water management practices and you'll see urbanization in the valley and then you'll start to see this coalescence of these two ways of living, I suppose. And so there'll be questions about how, how that will be managed, I suppose, over time. It's the best I can do on, on that one. It's a, it's a good question to keep an eye on for sure. Um, then intercultural learning and the limits to the inter, it's a great question as well. And I'm, I'm actually really glad you asked me that because I'm going to have to think a lot more about it, but it's a bit of both. So is it separate and then do they co cooperate at certain times or is it co-building for unitary governance is, is what I wrote down. It's, it's certainly not oriented towards um, continuous co-building or unitary governance, but this is the point I'm trying to make about not trying to collapse worlds into one in the sense that intercultural learning is also about respecting diversity um, and respecting plurality. And so you can't respect diversity and plurality if you're always trying to collapse everything into the same thing. So the inter has to, at some point, recognize the fact that there will be separate um, knowledge systems, there will be separate cultures that, that collaborate and, and dialogue with each other sometimes for the same goals, but sometimes not for the same goals. And, and I think there's an increasing body of work, and, and a lot of this comes from anthropologists actually in the Andes and around saying, we don't need to agree on everything all the time. Why, why are we so obsessed now with co-governance that ends up in some kind of agreement at the end of it, even though people walk out of the room kind of pissed off 
we need a way of managing systems that respects difference and respects contestation and respects the plurality of the world. And, and indigenous culturality in the Latin American sense is one approach to that. So that's kind of where I come from. And, and the idea of Iskaya Chai and a couple of pairs of knowledges is supposed to indicate that in the sense that it's not just two knowledges, right? If it's a couple of pairs, there's, there's, there's and you can have that in a Russian dolls kind of scenario, there's always going to be couples of pairs. And so you don't ever get to this point where, oh, we're, we're, we have one system. We've always got these, these multiplicities going on. Um, and so I'll have to end it with that, I think. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, and thank you for, for bringing this rich and really thought-provoking presentation to us and let us participate a bit in what you've accumulated in terms of knowledge and experience on the ground. You can really tell that it's, you know, you can draw on 10 years of experience and an insight and then raise some questions that we struggle with, right? In, in a way that's what we try to do at the center, learn from different local national contexts and relate it to question that we struggle with, you know, uh, governing the commons, uh, governing water, intercultural exchange, you know, drawing in different on different knowledges. There's so many topics that you brought up that speak very much to research agendas here. So thank you, Julian, for this.